Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 15th of June 2014. Welcome to all listeners, thanks for your support. Um, now in Odessa, Ukraine, where things are quite tranquil, um, most of the problems are occurring in East Ukraine, near areas such as Lugansk. Um, today's news, Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko has vowed to retaliate after, um, according to them, Russian separatists shot down a military plane in the east, killing 49 people, uh, mostly troops. Um, Poroshenko says that they will be punished and has called for an emergency meeting. This was a transport plane that came under anti-aircraft fire near the city of Lugansk. It um, reportedly was hit by two Stinger missiles and it was uh, carrying troops military equipment and it, it's thought to be the biggest loss of, loss of life suffered uh, by government forces um, in a single instance since this these problems began. Russia um, has condemned embassy attacks in Kiev um, after protests saw windows smashed, the Russian flag torn down and cars overturned. So unrest is still very much alive over here, just not so much where I am now in Odessa. Things were bad here maybe a couple of months ago, but things have quietened down. hope it stays that way personally. Um, other news, the um, Israeli army is conducting house-to-house -house searches in West Bank looking for three teenagers it uh, suspects has been abducted by Hamas. Um, Two 16-year-olds and one 19-year-old went missing on Thursday near um, near the north of Hebron. And Palestinian officials say that Israel has arrested at least 12 people in connection with this. And apparently this has gripped Israel with uh, coverage on the main TV channels. Uh, problems in Iraq again. So all the the wars over the last couple of decades... Um, apparently, we were told that they've made the world a safer place, but um, it doesn't. Look, it looks like they've made things either worse or um, certainly not good. So, um, U U.S. has deployed warships amid um, this crisis, and a U.S. aircraft carrier is going to take up a position in the Gulf, so that um, President Obama has some military options if the situation deteriorates. I mean deteriorates from what it's never it's never really been good over there has it um Isra iran is ready to assist the iraqi government uh, president hassan rouhani has said and but he's he's denied that iran has sent any troops but um he's told the bbc that some over a hundred iranian revolutionary guards had entered the country to provide military training and advice Insurgents have seized several major cities, including Mosul, and are closing in on Baghdad. They they look at Iraq's sheer majority as infidels. The Islamist State in Iraq, also known as ISIS, is a hardline Islamist militant group that grew up during the U.S.-led occupation from 2003 to 2011. It's one of several um, jihadist militias fighting the rule of al-Assad in neighboring Syria. Also in Pakistan, uh, 100 militants were killed overnight in airstrikes in the northwest tribal region bordering Afghanistan. In the week's news, thousands of Iraqi civilians are signing up to fight ISIS, those Sunni, Sunni sorry, Arab jihadists, um, which are also in Syria. Um, ISIS has beaten Iraqi security forces in their advance through the nation, leading Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki to announce that civilians would be armed for offensives against these militants. And the volunteer effort received a boost from words of encouragement from the Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani, al a top Shiite cleric across um, Iraq.
citizens who are able to bear arms and fight terrorists defending their country and their people and their holy places should volunteer and if they sacrifice their lives for the cause of defending their countries you'll be a martyr so that's something to look forward to for them I mean I, I sometimes wonder what happens if uh, one day all Muslim clerics get together and announce that um, all infidels should be killed um, I think it's one of the fears of non-Muslims. I mean, it's slightly alarmist, of course. Um, but it's 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 a problem with organised religions and the ones that have men in charge are called clerics uh, who wield power, but they're not gods. I mean, anyone who's on this planet, in my opinion, they're just men. You know, you can say what you like, but um, they don't have any any more intelligence than anyone else, or or at least not that much. Um, I just I just think it, there's a concern that they can they can say and do stuff or come to an opinion and they have a lot of control over people. I'm not in, that's not intended to offend any Muslims that are listening, but I would invite any um any particular Muslim with authority that would like to come on and defend the religion and get rid of some of the negative connotations that the uh, the Islam and the Muslim religion has picked up from the media to come and talk to us because this is part of the problem there's not enough talking about this um, I haven't heard enough Muslims discussing these big issues um, and not enough condemnation of atrocities and, and and just talking about things rather than getting upset if um, you know sometimes it feels like you have to tread around on eggshells whilst talking about this topic so if you are a Muslim and you'd like to come on and defend this religion and, and discuss some of the issues, please get in touch. According to Russia Today, Ukrainian troops are levelling towns and Russia is providing humanitarian aid to Ukrainian citizens. Russia Today used to be a good channel, but it's so biased and full of uh, propaganda now that um, it's only good to watch it to get one very biased side of a story. It would make a very bad drinking game, for example, if... Um, you had a drink every time RT said something negative about Russia. It just doesn't happen. You'll just be sitting with your glass in hand and not drinking a drop. Last episodes we talked about protests, challenging governments and authority. In the conspiracy world, which um, I put in inverted commas as often issues labelled as conspiracies, are, um, are often people asking questions with very good reason. There are people who go too far. I mean... Labelling everything a PSYOP or a conspiracy does nothing to help people find the truth. And there's always the possibility that some of those people, disinformation agents, or they could just be annoying and a bit immature. Um, I've seen photos, for example, where people are being accused of being called uh, um, crisis actors when they're clearly not the same people. I'm not saying there aren't crisis actors. With Sandy Hook, there's definitely questions to be asked there, but we don't have to extend that to every single world event. And... If you if you put two photos alongside each other and they're vaguely similar, like they've got the same colour hair, that's not the same as being the same person. I just find those a bit stupid. And it, it just makes people look a bit bonkers, you know. We have to question everything, but also we have to be intelligent about it. There's a lot of questions being asked about world events because the official line of events doesn't add up. For example, with 9-11, with the JFK assassination, with the Boston bombing, with Sandy Hook. Roswell, Lady Diana's death, Michael Hastings' death, David Kelly's death, chemtrails, fluoride in the water, uh, Bohemian Grove, Bilderberg Group. Um, there's there's loads and loads of them I could go on. Um, but I'd also include MH370 disappearance in that list. There's a lot of things that occurred around that situation that do not add up. And it does, it does no good just to say people who question this, these events will say there's a cover-up are conspiracy theorists. It doesn't help. It's, that's just not the case. It, people who say that end up looking stupid themselves, in my opinion. I don't think that's in their intention. Um, I'm talking about people who totally accept whatever is fed to them by the media and, and government, who label people who question events immediately as conspiracy nuts. Um, in some ways, I hope they're right that governments do love and protect us and uh, what we hear and what we're told is what is exactly happened. Only the problem is um, people question these events and um, don't believe them, not because um, they're paranoid, but because history tells us that this is what happens, that most of these things are not correct. 
Um, so you just have to look at history. And it seems that people who don't believe in conspiracies actually have forgotten history. Um, so it ends up making them look stupid, in my opinion. And it also is there's a danger that if you don't question your governments, then um, tyrannical governments get away with the things they do. And that's what's happened in the past. If you look at some of the things our governments have done in the past to continue to do, you'll find that they they kill, basically. Governments do kill, rightly or wrongly. I mean, in some situations, that's open to debate. But, for example, um, international governments kill via capital punishment. Now, a lot of people um, actually uh, in, are in favour of capital punishment. That's another debate. I'm just saying that governments do kill by using the electric chair, firing squad, hanging. Um, they also kill in uh, wars, more recently in Iraq, Afghanistan, also in Ukraine, in, in, and in the past in Vietnam. Increasingly, they're using drones and technology. I mean, at some point, this, these, uh, this drone technology is going to have artificial intelligence. That's not too far away. I mean, this week, or in the last couple of weeks, a computer passed an AI test and some successfully convinced other humans that it was human in comparison to other bots, online bots. Um, so how long is it going to be before that kind of technology is, is placed within drones so that actually the human control aspect is going to be taken away so drones will be making decisions as to whether someone live or, lives or dies. Now that sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, but I, d I don't think we're very far away personally. Let me know what you think about that. Don't forget to put any comments in uh, the comments section about um, ideas for topics you'd like us to discuss. Today's um, show is going to be about missing aircraft over the years. We're going to talk about a number of previous cases um, with a view to looking at um, MH370, again revisiting the topic. We're not going to talk too much about MH370 today, although Sarah Bajak will be joining us towards the end of the program to give us a quick update and tell us um, about the plan to encourage whistleblowers to come forward. Soon we're going to go to Anthony, our academic researcher from the University of Bill Kent, uh, to talk about missing planes. I just wanted to go through a little bit of a summary of uh, some of the missing planes over the years. I mean, today we, sorry, in the last couple of days we had the Ukrainian plane being shot down by pro-Russian rebels. Um, I use those terms, I mean, pro-Russian or um, activists, if you like. Um, that was with 50 people on board. We Also in the last few days, I think on Friday the 13th, um, Richard Rockefeller, the son of um, David Rockefeller was piloting a small plane that crashed shortly after takeoff. Obviously, some people are going to be saying that was because uh, he wasn't towing the family line, but um, who knows? Um, there's been all kinds of missing planes over the years. I'm just going to run through a couple, uh, run through some. There was a Joyride uh, plane. It was dubbed the Joyride plane because uh, it was believed that a lot of people on board were drinking alcohol. Crashed in the Urals. Uh, with 13 people on board, one, and uh, it wasn't discovered until a year later, so it was missing, but it was found in a swamp. Um, in the same region as the Dyatlov Pass incident, which we're going to be covering on another episode, so some people say that's got some kind of spooky connection, but um, there was Iran Flight 655, uh, which was bound from Tehran to Dubai, shot down by the United States. Um, so people who think that um, passenger planes don't get shot down, just look at history. There's lots of cases of them. Itavia Flight 870 uh, was going over the Tyrrhenian Sea between Ponza and Ustica, uh, killed all people on board. And uh, there was a lot of um, questions as to how it was brought down. It was eventually uh, ruled by it Italy's top criminal court that there was plenty of evidence that the flight was brought down by a missile, despite initially that not being the case, that being denied. So again, cases of uh, planes going down and no government involvement. Later on, it turns out that everyone accepts that there was government involvement. So what I'm trying to say is, looking at history, you can see that there has been cover-ups. Um, in 1951, there was a military flight from New Mexico to Suffolk, England, 
and it had to stage an emergency land in the sea following an in-flight fire. Um, despite the landing going well and a successful evacuation taking place, this was done sort of over the radio, when rescuers arrived on the scene, uh, they saw all the flares going up so they knew everyone had evacuated, but when they got there, there was no sign of the 53 passengers of the aircraft. Um, some people speculate the Soviet submarines came and took the passengers. Polish Air Force Tu-154, which I'm, we're going to discuss with Anthony a bit, um, this crashed with um, quite a large number, including the President of Poland, quite a large number of people, I think 96 people on board. A lot of conspiracy theories surrounding that. Um, there's, there's a documentary online which suggests that even some passengers who may have survived were shot by the Russians. Um, I'm not saying um, that's true or not, that's just what you, what you can find online. Um, there was a Flying Tiger Line uh, Flight 739, uh, which was um, uh, a flight in 1932 carrying 19 military personnel, took off from Guam, but never arrived at its destination in the Philippines. There was no distress call, and no wreckage has ever been found. Another plane carrying secret cargo rather than soldiers, because this, this plane that I just mentioned was carrying soldiers, also departed from the same airport at a similar time and it also crashed I think there were that was found though TWA flight 841 uh, fell 40,000 feet and managed to pull out of it landed both pilots um, the pilots were blamed uh, for this incident although they protested their innocence so that's one of the things that um, we're going to talk about as well is that pilots often get the blame for this especially if the plane crashes these ones are at least able to stand up for themselves of course there's TWA flight 800 which many people are familiar with um, on the way to Paris hundreds of witnesses seeing missiles hit the plane um, FBI were accused of a cover-up. We'll be talking about that one later. Air France 447, 228 people on board, no distress call, um, disappeared in the into the Atlantic from Rio to Paris. It was missing for five days. The black box was found two years later. All contact was lost after their final transmission. Um, aircraft investigators said that all the um, systems on board started shutting down and um, the official explanation was ice crystals on the pitot tubes was the main cause of that crash also a storm pan am 7 uh, crashed no distress call high levels of carbon monoxide found in the bodies Northwest Orient 2501 disappeared over Lake Michigan, never found, even though um, sonar was used to try and detect it. An unidentified blip spotted on a radar in Lake Superior 1953. Two planes were sent out to investigate this radar blip. As they watched the radar, these three blips merged, uh, disappeared and were never seen again and the uh, victims in this case were Lieutenant Monkler and Lieutenant Wilson. There was the case of the Boeing 727 stolen in Angola, never seen again in 2003 despite FBI and CIA launching massive search. Two men um, boarded the plane, apparently they weren't pilots but um, took off, slightly dodgy takeoff I think, but um, took off and were never seen again. A cargo plane belonging to Varig Brazilian Airlines disappeared in 1979, just 30 minutes after it took off from Narita International Airport in Tokyo. There was 153 paintings on board valued at more than 1.2 million dollars. Neither the plane, its crew or the paintings have ever been seen since. Uh, of course, we've got the Bermuda Triangle, um, five U.S. Navy Avenger planes. A lot of people might be familiar with that story that um, that disappeared. A plane was sent out to investigate the disappearance. That also disappeared. This was off the Florida coast. They've never been found again, although there are documentaries where people think they may have found the plane, but it's never been confirmed. They, some, I think one person reckoned they found one of the planes. Not being confirmed, though. 
U.S. Air Force C-97 vanished 200 miles from Tokyo. 67 people were on board, never found. Israel accused Ukraine of hiding a missile strike that destroyed um, one of their jets. Um, that was initially denied. I think uh, um, this was Flight 1812. Um, there were 78 people on board. An Israeli government official told the Telegraph newspaper that investigators were due to leave to get the necessary permission to fly to a Ukrainian airport close to where the Sabir Airlines jet crashed. We suspect they're going to try to cover something up, something, something they do not want to foreign eyes to see. So again, a case of um, even governments accusing each other of cover-ups. So um, it's not out of the question to say that cover-ups go on because they obviously do. Even governments admit it. Malaysian Airlines Flight 653 1977 hijacked mid-air and crashed. Nobody's ever recovered. Flight uh, KAL-07 shot down by Russians but nobody's ever found. And we're going to be talking about that later. Korean Airlines Flight 902 um, failed to respond to Soviet ground control and interceptors. Soviet air defense initially identified it as part of the US Air Reconnaissance Force which carried out thousands of flights along Soviet borders. Captain Alexander Bozov, pilot of the Su-15 that brought down Flight 902, saw Asian characters on the tail of the Korean aircraft and reported this to ground control. Despite this, um, Vladimir Sarkov, commander of the 21st Soviet Air Defense Corps, ordered Bosov to take down the plane as the plane failed to respond to repeated orders to land. So they opened fire, took the plane down and killed two of the 109 total passengers and crew members aboard. The plane actually did manage to make an emergency landing on a frozen lake, so um, at least the majority of passengers survived in that case. So let's let's go to Anthony and let's um, talk about some of these cases in more detail. We can see whether we can learn from any of these uh, incidents in the past and apply it to the present. Hello, Anthony. Hi, Scott. How's things with you? Ah, oh, not too bad. Not too bad. It's been a quiet week here in Turkey, but I hear you're back in Odessa. How are things there? Well, things are surprisingly nice here. I mean, uh, last time I left, there were crowds marching down the street towards my taxi there was bombs going off and um and guns being fired in the center so um it's now it's a place of peace and tranquility people sunbathing it's beautiful weather here people are hitting the beaches and uh sitting outside cafes so it couldn't be any more any more different but of course um a lot of the fighting and the bloodshed seems to be going on in east ukraine now yeah, yeah. Yesterday, um, yesterday was a particularly uh, intense day. I heard. Well, I think they had the highest death toll yesterday because a military plane was shot down. Um, Forty-nine Ukrainian service personnel on board. That was in eastern Ukraine near Lugansk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I really hope this uh, this comes to an end soon. It's it's just. It is just, um, you know, feeding the country into its its own mincer. I think it, it has to stop soon. Yeah, I mean, this this plane was carrying troops and military equipment, and um, it does seem strange they seem to be getting hold of the uh, military equipment like these Stinger missiles, which were apparently what brought this plane down, and the, and the tanks we've been seeing. This doesn't seem like the kind of equipment you'd normally expect um, citizens to be able to get hold of. No. Well, I mean, a, a few of the... Um, a, a few of the separatists which is what the media likes to call them now uh have said that they that they've just found these things lying around in you know weapon stockpiles in different parts of ukraine but i personally don't find that much more plausible than if they'd said you know we, we ordered it online from an american catalog <laughs> it just doesn't it doesn't really it doesn't really add up there's clearly weapons coming from somewhere you're a conspiracy theorist anthony i am I am a wacky conspiracy theorist. Yeah, you nut job. I mean, of course they, uh, of course they found the tanks and the missiles lying around. <laughs> Some of them at the back of shops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. So things have got worse in East Ukraine, and um, it's very easy when you're in a country and um, like I'm in Odessa now, and people are walking around. The sun's out, and there's not, you know, there's no feelings of um, 
of nervousness here at all at the moment. It's very easy to forget what's happening in the same country, another part of the country that people are dying, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Um, my, my wife is in Lviv now, and, you know, I think almost everybody thought me uh, completely insane for for uh, letting her go there, if, if that's the right word, <laughs> for not trying to talk her out of it. But, but you know, Lviv is the same at the moment. It's, you know, the diff- the distance between Lviv and, and Donetsk, because it, Ukraine is such a huge country, you know, the difference between, the, the distance between Lviv and, and Donetsk, is, it's like, you know, Paris to Prague. So... But at the same time, it is very strange that, that, that parts of the country are just, you know, birds singing, people sunbathing, and other parts are, are you know, life and death struggles. Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, uh, the same with um, when I'm in England, people wondering why I'm going to Ukraine. But, you know, you could probably fit quite a number of Englands into this country. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot of little chefs. Yeah, yeah exactly. Anyway, today we're talking about planes. Um, what um, what kind of incidents have you come across that have uh, struck your interest? Oh, well, quite a lot actually. This is um, again well done for choosing a huge topic. I mean, yeah, sorry we about li- that. it's fine. I, I personally find uh, aviation mysteries uh, quite quite fascinating. So there's a lot to discuss. But uh, to start off with, I just want to say that um, you know these incidents are are interesting from a political point of view or, or from a kind of Unsolved, un, unsolved mysteries point of view, uh, but they are also tragic events. And so, so of course, we we need to be sensitive to the fact that you know, while we speculate about what might have happened to a particular plane, we, we are talking about uh, events that involved people dying, and and a lot of those people have surviving relatives. So, so it is a, a subject that can, that can be uh, tricky to talk about. But m- let's try and see how we go. Absolutely. I mean, you and I have spoken about MH370 before, and um, obviously for families that are related to that incident, it's, um, I imagine if, if they're listening to people talking about um, the incident as if it was something, some kind of form of entertainment, they could get upset. But yeah, no, I mean, definitely um, we are sensitive to that. And yeah. even, even with past events you know, that happened 50 years ago, um, you know, we, we're all aware that people have died in these situations. So we're not talking about as a form of entertainment, we're just kind of talking about, um, you know, how maybe we can learn from these events as well. Exactly. And I think uh, if you start looking into air disasters as a phenomenon, uh, the first thing you find is that the vast majority of planes that go down, uh, go down because of factors like the weather, mechanical failure, and occasionally uh, bad judgment calls by pilots, things like this. But you also find uh, exceptions, and in these exceptional cases, there are certain patterns or or types of air disaster, we could say. So so I want to focus mainly on on two of those today. Uh, The first one is that in a surprisingly large number of cases, there's some kind of involvement by either the government or the military. I mean... Most countries uh, have an agency dedicated to investigating uh, air disasters. So to that extent, uh, any crash or or mysterious happening involving an airplane automatically becomes a government matter. But we'll we'll talk about those agencies a bit later. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, other types of government involvement. And look, these are very instructive cases to study, I think. Because once again, they they bring up the question about what role governments ought to play in our lives. So very often when they're they're involved, it's it's not in a good way. You know, either either they're shooting down civilian airliners, and those are extreme cases, but they they have happened, or they're they're blocking or influencing an investigation, or they simply have information that they decide not to release to to grieving relatives for political reasons. And that is an important point to make, I I believe, because... um you know, if you question events around MH370, and I've had people um, say this to me, you're branded a conspiracy theorist, nut job. Um, and basically, it's not a question of just complete speculation. It's a question of looking at the past and seeing that there have been cases in the past where uh, missile strikes have been denied or things have been denied for whatever reason, and then have later turned out to be uh, there were missiles or the events that people were questioning, uh, they were quite right to do so. 
Yeah, there are there are cases where uh, a very long time after the fact, a government will come out and say, yes, this did happen. Um, we'll talk about one uh, a little bit later, I think, uh, well, we may talk about one, um, which was the, um, the, the Katyn massacre in Poland, denied for well, decades, but after the, the fall of the, the Soviet Union, uh, the Russian government slowly came around to the point where it could uh, acknowledge this, this massacre and, and you know, um, apologize to the, to the victims. And that, that does happen. It's happened with a few uh, air disasters as well. But of course, at the time, if you, uh, if you are peddling the, the theory, for example, that uh, a missile shot down an airplane and the government is saying, well, well, no, it didn't. Yeah, there are there are people who who are quite um, who are quite intolerant about that. Indeed. Um, and what what kind of um, cases um, were you going to talk about today? What was the first one? Well, I wanted to talk about the missile cases, so to speak. Um, there's some rather famous ones, like like Korean Airlines uh, Flight 007. This was a, a Boeing 747 on a flight from New York to Seoul via Anchorage in in 1983. Now. To fly that route in the 1980s, you, you had to pass reasonably close, but not perilously close, to Soviet airspace. And it was something that pilots had to be careful of, because the Americans had been deliberately sending surveillance planes into those parts of the USSR's airspace as a kind of uh, what the Russians would call provokatsya, a, a provocative gesture. And some of these planes, if you viewed them from underneath, had a specific kind of engine configuration that looked a lot like a Boeing 747. So there was definitely a risk there on, on long haul flights. And so, um, I, I must admit, I, in some of the instances I looked at, there, were, there was also mention of this, that the sometimes civilian aircraft were used as kind of guinea pigs to test um, surveillance and how, you know, how far people would go. And there's been, even been speculation about MH370 that in, you know, in the, the way that it switched off the transponder and flew over different airspace was a test to see what kind of reaction, what kind of technology countries had there. Yeah, and I'll tell you something else. The switching off the transponder thing has been an extremely effective technique in the past. I want to talk to you about another case of that a bit later. Okay. Um, but this flight 007, the Korean Airlines flight, got disastry, disastrously, of course, and it flew over Sakhalin Island, which was Soviet territory, and it was shot down by a Russian fighter jet using two missiles. The thing is, though, when, when it was hit, the aircraft was already back in international waters, so it had passed over the island and was outside of the boundaries. Now, the Soviet military um, painted this whole incident as one in which the 747 pilots ignored all kinds of protocols, they behaved suspiciously, changing their altitude. The plane looked like a spy plane, and all kinds of things. They're supposed also, to. Um, they're supposed to fire warning shots, aren't they, before they take a plane down? Yeah, across the bow of the plane, I believe it is. Uh, across the nose, I should say. <laughs> um, they also said that because of uh, Arctic winds and the fact that their intercept fighters had been out on a mission and were coming back, so they were low on fuel, they couldn't do the usual fly alongside protocol, which is standard when you need to identify whether a plane is military or civilian. Um, but uh, it turned out later that the actual fighter pilot knew it was a civilian plane, or at least he had uh, he's officially said that he knew this. And this is... So um this is Major Gennady Osipovich. Yes, Osipovich, that's right. And what he said was, uh, I could see rows of windows and I knew it was a Boeing, but I didn't tell air traffic control it was a Boeing and they didn't ask. So either that's true and he is uh, a fanatic or he's being used as a scapegoat. And I personally think both of these are, are possible. Yeah, because I, I read the um, transcript as well. And if it is true that what he said... He seemed extremely casual and a bit flippant about the whole thing, despite the fact we're talking about 269 passengers and crew being killed in this incident. Yeah, he did. He was talking about how it didn't make any difference because sometimes civilian planes are used for military purposes and so on. Really, not a <laughs> not, not a cuddly toy kind of guy, really. Um, but, yeah, look, at, at, at the time... Um, when that happened, the Reagan administration, uh, whose leader we're now told, you know, helped to end the Cold War, though in fact 
he didn't do any such thing. The Reagan administration used it to uh, ramp up the, the rhetoric against against the, the evil empire. You know, they, they'd already been doing uh, all kinds of stuff to uh, stoke fears inside the USSR of a, of a nuclear first strike. So, so everything from uh, ordering Pershing missiles to be installed in Europe and pointed straight at Russia to holding, um, they, they held the largest ever naval fleet exercise in history in the North Pacific, right near the border where the Korean plane was shot down just a couple of months before. Um, so, you know, the Russians were, were understandably very worried about what Reagan's intentions were. Yeah. And so this, if you, if you add it all up, it's a, it's a classic case of where the pilots made an error. They'd, uh, they drifted so far off course that they were out of range of the usual beacon signals that can tell you you're drifting. Yeah. But it was the actions of governments and the military which made that a far more dangerous situation than, than it should have been. And um, the, I mean, talking about suppression of evidence, apparently the evidence was suppressed by um, the, so the Soviets. Um, the flight data recorders uh, were only released eight years later after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm, that's right, that's right. Um, they, they suppressed they suppressed all of that. And in fact, there were conspiracy theories based on the fact that bodily remains didn't appear. Conspiracy theories that all of the passengers had somehow been captured and were being held prisoner. But that turned out not to be the case. But it was what, born of... Uh, what wasn't the case? What, they did find bodies? or Yeah, in the end, the, the, um, the Russian Federation produced remain, human remains. But, uh, ah, but were they the same passengers? <laughs> uh, this I can neither confirm nor deny, Scott. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you go f uh, forward a few years from that, then you come to um, Iran Air Flight 665. And this was a civilian airliner shot down by an American warship in 1988. Uh, and this happened against the background of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, during that war, the US military was doing its usual global watchdog thing, or, or if we're honest, it's, it's global energy source watchdog thing. So. <laughs> There were warships patrolling the Straits of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf, and one of them, called the Vincennes, shot down this airliner. It was well and truly inside Iranian airspace. I mean, there was, there was no question at all, and, and the US government had to issue an apology about it. The thing is, though, I actually saw an Australian documentary on this, and they uh, pointed the finger directly at the commander of the warship, who was rather hilariously named Will Rogers. Um, you know, they, they said uh, there were reports of Rogers being trigger happy and going off mission to try and provoke a crisis. And apparently his boat had even earned uh, a nickname, the, the Robo Cruiser. Um, and then they, they continued and said not everyone in the US Navy really wanted to put the warship in the Gulf in the first place. So they were really backpedaling away from this issue and putting this guy into the role of uh, sole aggressor, you know. And look, I, I think that that reading of events is possible, but I also think we have to bear in mind that the US and other governments have a long tradition of pinning their institutional mischief on private individuals. You know, we could go back to Lee Harvey Oswald and, and, and well beyond if, if you want to. Um, and it, it is a very useful strategy to point at the guy who, you know, pulled the trigger or gave a command and say he was a loose cannon. It was all his fault. We had nothing to do with it. And, and indeed, in a lot of these um, plane incidents, and particularly in the crashes, they often try and pin the um, the fault on the pilots as well, rather than blaming the plane. Um, in which case, companies like Boeing would have to make a, uh, very expensive adjustments, or blaming um, others. You know. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, pilot pilot error is always one of the first things looked at. Um, and occasionally it turns out to, to be the real cause, but, but very often it's, it's either a, a much more complex uh, combination of things or it's something completely different. Yeah. But uh, in this case, I mean, using this guy as the scapegoat just seems silly. I mean, if you are a loose cannon, how do you get your hands on a naval warship? It, it just doesn't seem very likely that you could. You know? <laughs> so I'm not overly convinced here. I think you could probably include this Iran Air uh, Flight 665 on the list of uh, civilian air airliners that have been shot down to serve some kind of government or military objective. So I, I have no idea what that is. And if um, that is the case, I mean, 
you think how how disgusting that is because there was 290 people on board 66 children including 66 children and, and this ranks um, apparently in the top 10 deadliest disasters in aviation history yeah yeah but i mean you know we've we've seen things like like this happen it's a, it's a very for me a very uh, strange way to go about things but we have seen it happen I, I mean, personally, I just don't think it's acceptable to, in this day and age, um, to shoot down passenger airlines for any reason whatsoever. Um, yeah. there, there should be enough technology to know that it's a, a um, passenger airline and enough, enough knowledge, surveillance not knowledge, to know that these are passengers, it's not a spy plane or anything like that, you know. And just because one of these may drift into... Um, the wrong airspace. This one actually didn't even do that. You said right? It wasn't even in the mm -hmm. the wrong airspace. That's even, right. even, even if it was, like in the uh, the previous case you talked about, it's not acceptable to shoot down people, especially if you haven't made uh, contact. Which the previous case you talked about, the KAL 07, they'd they tried to contact them on a military um, airwave, which the pilot had no, the passenger airline had no uh, receiver to receive that message. I mean. That's right. So he was, uh, you know, in military terms, maintaining radio silence. And the next thing you do is try and establish visual contact. But the the uh, the military's excuse was our planes are nearly out of fuel. We couldn't do it. Which is, I mean, I I, I don't know. Like, I think to some extent it reflects the paranoia of the time. But but even that it is, even so, it's it's just not a good enough excuse. It's not, and it's uh, again point. Um, I think it it just reminds us that. There's nothing wrong with questioning the um, official uh, line of events because history has shown us in these two cases you've already mentioned that uh, governments ha are responsible for the deaths of passengers on on airlines um, and you know so there's no there's no reason why they're not going to do it again in the future. That's right. Yeah. If you go uh, again a few years forward from from Iraq, the Iran air incident, of course you have the uh, infamous TWA uh, TWA flight 800, which I think is probably one of the most controversial in in terms of what you're talking about. Uh, most of your listeners have probably heard about it, but the basic facts again, it was a Boeing 747. It took off from JFK Airport. It was going to Rome. Uh, 12 minutes into the flight, it crashed into the ocean off the coast of New York. Now, the official crash, the cause of the crash, was a fire in one of the aircraft's fuel tanks. But the cause of that fire could not be definitively established. And even in the official report, uh, the investigators uh, spoke of uh, that the investigators wrote that the fire was most likely caused by an electrical component short circuiting. But look, as, as far as I can tell, this was basically as much guesswork as anything else. And most significantly, uh, that report flatly uh, contradicted a large number of eyewitness accounts of the disaster. There were um, over 200 witness statements taken by the FBI that described two flaming objects scream, uh, <laughs> streaking upwards towards the plane from the ground and then converging on the plane. And the behavior of these objects seemed to mirror the behavior of surface-to-air missiles. So there was, a, there was a ton of speculation about that initially. Um, and as with the uh, UFO uh, phenomenon that we talked about a few weeks ago, um, Initially, it was okay to talk about this missile theory, but later uh, it was shut down, and and so it was deemed that anybody who went with the missile argument was a was a you know nutty conspiracy theorist. I know, and um, I, I'm young enough to remember this incident, and I remember the actual um, before the official um, response to what caused the crash came out. I um, on the actual um, the, the days around this event. I saw people coming on TV saying they saw missiles coming up from the sea. I mean, they were talking about missiles breaking through the water, going up and hitting the plane. I mean, people aren't stupid. You know, I trust witnesses. I trust members of the public way more than I trust these um, investigations. People who find bits of metal and then say there were no missiles, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and this was, um, I mean, this, this got a little desperate. I mean... At one point, uh, the CIA was, was brought in. It wasn't uh, 
it wasn't the the safety board's first choice, but these were the only guys who would do it um, because it was so it was so morally dodgy. <laughs> the CIA came in and produced a video about the crash, and it gave a frankly ridiculous description of events. So if you watch the video, you see this explosion in the center of the plane where the fuel tanks are. Then the nose comes off the plane, and then because the center of gravity has shifted backwards. Uh, the video shows the back half of the plane tilting upwards and kind of bobbing up into the sky a few thousand meters. And they say this would account for why so many people saw something moving up through the sky. The CIA said it was half of the plane. But I mean, ugh, come on. <laughs> it's, it's silly and it, it's um, against all of the basic principles of aerodynamics. You know? and, in, and in fact, some of the original witnesses to that event, I saw a documentary the other day where they listened to this explanation and they thought, also thought it was ridiculous and laughable and said that's not what they saw. I mean, it's all very well for people to use computer modeling and to reconstruct events based on um, fragments. But when mm -hmm. these people say that's not what they saw, you have to trust their judgment, you know, especially yeah. when you're not talking about one person, you're talking about a number of people. Yeah, it's absolutely not what they saw, and it's absolutely not what would happen if you had a half a tube um, in the air that weighed several thousand tons open at one end with air rushing into it at about 500 miles an hour. It wouldn't go bobbing happily up into the sky. You know, it's just not, not feasible. And I, I think that was uh, an indication of, of, of how lazy the American government um, was becoming by then. I mean, the justification of the war in Iraq six years later was, was so flimsy and so transparent that I, I personally was genuinely shocked. I mean, I, I thought they were capable of far more subtle lies than that. You know, and the same with this video. It just, it just doesn't bear serious consideration. It does, seem, it does seem like they're becoming very lazy with their cover-ups these days. I mean, I don't know what you think about the Osama bin Laden um, raid, but personally, I, I think that's a bit of a joke as well. Um, I mean, they they say that they killed Osama bin Laden in that raid, and then they say, then we took him to sea and buried his body at sea because according to Muslim principles or something, which um, there's so many holes in that explanation. Number one, what you mean? So we've been looking for this guy for many years. Um, you know, there's there's lots of conspiracy th uh, theories around, and you're going to say that oh yeah, we can't show you the body. Um, he's he's buried at sea, and then number two, you're going to say we buried him there at sea uh, out of respect to the Muslim community when the guy is not supposed to be considered a Muslim. We've been told in the past this is not, you know, th this is a, just a someone who likes waging war. He's not really a true Muslim. So. Um, yeah, and, no, and num number three, where was the US government taking down all of the execution pictures of Saddam Hussein if they're so concerned about that? Why, why didn't they go around taking those down off YouTube and the other sites where it appeared? Exactly, and the same with the Libyan um, Colonel Gaddafi, you know, there was videos of him being brutally um, murdered on the streets, basically. Yeah, uh, They absolutely. were left up as well, so people, well very... people can quite easily handle this, you know. Yeah. I agree, I agree, and, and you know, I think a lot of people needed closure. But anyway, um, look, the, the, the missile theory persists, and uh, in fact, there are even those who say that uh, the, same, the same characters uh, behind shooting down Flight 800 may also have had some, some hand in September the 11th, so that if, if that's at all true, if there's any truth to that, then the US government ignored a huge threat for, for political reasons. But then there are others who suspect a certain amount of foreknowledge, that is, that, that the US government uh, in some way may have known about this threat of a missile attack. So, we, I mean, altogether I would say that, that TA, TWA 100 is a, it's a pretty disturbing and, and divisive incident. You know? And also I read that um, there were some investigators that because of because there was so many people who didn't believe this official uh, line, there were some investigators who managed to get hold of um, some of the materials from the crash, mm -hmm. and showed that actually there was residue um, towards the centre of the plane, I believe, on some of the seats, which showed that it was a missile strike. And they these investigators were arrested for tampering with classified materials, with, inten um, with intention of causing conspiracy. 
I believe, yeah, I believe that did happen because the people who took those materials were not the official investigators in the case, I, as far as I recall. Um, and so, yeah, they they, uh, they did find traces of, of residue which would tally with the idea of a missile and, you know, immediately arrested. So, where does that leave us? And Well, it leaves us thinking, why on earth do people keep que uh, uh, questioning people who, who ask questions when, again, we keep having these situations in the past where there's obvious cover-ups going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I mentioned before, most countries have an agency that, uh, that deals with uh, trans transport disasters uh, or specifically with air disasters. And, and in the USA, it's the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, the, N the NTSB. Now, I would say, generally speaking, they're, they're relatively uncontroversial as government agencies go because their people are aviation experts rather than, you know, career politicians or bureaucrats, intelligence officers. So generally their job is just to investigate a crash in the hope that they'll learn something which will enable them to do a fix on other aircraft so the same kind of crash won't happen again. But um, inevitably, once in a while, there is a plane crash that carries some political implications. And, and here, I think the role of the agencies becomes a bit more questionable. Um, for a start, if there's any possibility of criminal involvement, then the FBI gets involved. And they don't always play nice with the, with the Transportation Safety Board. And certainly in the case of TWA 800, they didn't. They, they essentially took the investigation over. Um, but also, there have been claims that Bill Clinton put some fairly heavy pressure on investigators and on, and on agencies about Flight 800. It's, uh, it was timed very poorly in terms of uh, upcoming elections. And so you know, when these uh, issues become politicized, then, then the reliability of the agencies, I think, is, is sometimes in question. Um, and I just wanted to mention that also in, in a lot of the instance, um, not that there's a conspiracy in everything, but um, there is, if there's bias in the investigation, then that, that's not, you know, that should be looked at. I mean, for example, Boeing in the past have done their own investigations on their own aircraft, yeah. which is yeah. clear bias. You can't have the company that's going to be affected by the results doing the investigation because, you know, it could be potentially very expensive. There could be some expensive changes that need to be made. So it's in their own interest. It's own interest for a commercial cover-up and then you have um, you have governments who obviously could might be responsible for compensation as well yeah and a big uh, a big question about Air France uh, 447 concerns exactly this problem um, the uh, 447 crashed uh, in the Atlantic Ocean in 2009 en route from Rio de Janeiro to Paris everybody on board was killed um, and it turned out that uh, the faulty part was something called a pitot tube, which every airplane has. Once you've seen a picture of a pitot tube, you'll be able to see them easily on the outside of every airplane. They, Sorry, they uh, which, which flight was this? This was Air France 447. Uh, it went down in 2009. Um, the pitot tubes are meant to um, measure airspeed, and uh, they have a problem, or they had a problem with a particular model of pitot tube that was icing up. And so then the airspeed readings were incorrect, which leaves an air aircraft in, in danger of either flying too fast, um, which, which can have disastrous consequences. Uh, you can break the, the sound barrier in a civilian airplane and, and the plane is not built to deal with that, or flying too slow and going into a stall. Now, they, uh, these particular pitot tubes, it was known by the airline uh, that there were faults with them. There had been several um, faults logged by pilots with the pitot tube saying the airspeed is just clearly not right. These tubes are icing over. Um, there had been problems with the specific model of pitot tube that Air France was using on its Airbus aircraft. Um, several of these problems had been logged by pilots who said that the tubes were not giving accurate airspeed readings and recommended that they be looked into. The airline had decided to replace them, but was very slow in replacing them. In fact, you know, the, the replacement, uh, they were going to be slowly phased in. And it's arguable that had they said, okay, we'll just spend the money now, uh, that plane may have had a better chance of making it back to Paris and the 250 odd people who died might still be alive. I think it was uh, 228 people. There was no distress call again in this situation. This was the one um, from Rio to to Europe, yeah, to Paris, I think. 
That's right. Yeah. Um, now yeah. the black box was found two years later. Mm -hmm. um, from what I from what I know about this uh, particular incident, um, basically everything started shutting down again. The autopilot was initially to blame. There seems to be a lot of um, very rare incidents that all occurred at the same time, which left me slightly skeptical on their uh, explanation for this event. Apparently, they headed into a storm, um, which the plane didn't deal with very well. Mm -hmm. the, aut the autopilot disengaged on its own. Mm -hmm. Everything started shutting down, a bit like my um, laptop does sometime for no reason. <laughs> um, and this, then, then this other very rare instant of supercooled water, um, which affected the pitot tubes, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't usually happen. Um, and it's, they started to freeze. I mean, why they can't be slightly heated? You'd think if, because they're very small, these little these pitot tubes, they're very they small. You, you would think that... Um, something that small couldn't bring a plane down and if it could why not just make them heated so that the super cooled water doesn't have an effect on them i believe uh, i believe what may have happened after that tragedy is that uh piso tubes may have been fitted with sensors the, the plane has several of them and i think the plane has other means of measuring airspeed that are you know kind of backup systems so if there's a sensor on there telling the pilot that the pizza tube has iced over the pilot can find other means of uh of finding out or calculating the airspeed of the airplane but that that wasn't the case before but uh anyway i think that uh in terms of the in terms of the agencies who investigate i think that they do a good and sincere job for most of the time but there are problems as as we've discussed um, in the case of TWA 800, because it was deemed a criminal uh, case, then the FBI took over and there was an official in charge called James Colstrom. He, uh, he had extensive contact with Clinton over this issue. And of course the, result, uh, the report that, uh, that, that resulted was, uh, you know, it, it totally denied the missile theory. Now, four years later, uh, it just so happened that on September the 11th, 2001, uh, this official, James Colstrom, was interviewed on CNN. And he seemed to have a momentary brain explosion, uh, <laughs> which, which just screamed regret uh, to, to some viewers. You know. So he was being interviewed by Dan Rather, and Rather asked him about the causes and factors which had led up to the World Trade Center attacks. And uh, Colstrom suddenly blurted out on the air, we need to stop the hypocrisy <laughs> to, <clears throat> to millions of viewers, you know, sounding like a nutty conspiracy theory, uh, conspiracy theorist himself. And then he, he, uh, <clears throat> he quickly caught himself <laughs> and said, uh, well, not that hypo hypocrisy got us here. You know, I'm not saying that it did, definitely not. So, but he, he just, I don't know, the, the, the mask came down for a second. It was a really interesting moment. Right, that's, that is interesting, yeah. And um, so what other cases have you come across? Yeah, quickly one more missile case before we move on from missiles. This one was uh, Air Italia Flight 870 in uh, 2000. It was flying from Bologna to Palermo, which involves uh, brief briefly crossing the sea, and it crashed into the Mediterranean. Uh, the pilots didn't issue a mayday call, and it seemed that the plane was just flying normally one second and then in pieces all over the sky the next second. Now, at the time... Uh, Libya was the kind of international bad guy, and there was a dogfight, apparently, between Libyan jets and French jets in that part of the Mediterranean. And the, the dogfight involved an exchange of missiles. A little while after the incident, uh, a Libyan fighter was found, crashed into the side of a mountain in France, and it had apparently been shot down by a French fighter. And again, uh, on top of that, eyewitness accounts uh, of the Air Atavia crash strongly suggested a missile going towards the, the plane. Now, now this is uh, an oddly current uh, event because, again, the NTSB from the US was involved uh, in the investigation because it was an American-made plane. And they ruled that there had been an explosion in the plane's bathroom. In other words, someone had planted a bomb on the plane. The Italian courts did not agree with them, and neither did the Italian media, and neither did the, the Italian public. Uh, but I, I don't know. It, it appears as though the theory suited the government because according to the law there, if the plane had been shot down by a missile, the government would have owed compensations to the victim's families. So this report about the bomb was accepted and various people you know, remained pissed off with it, especially since uh, 
because the public thought it was a missile attack, nobody believed in the bomb theory, the government didn't have to investigate the bomb theory, which means that if it was a bomb, whoever planted it basically got away. Um, but anyway, the, the issue seemed to have passed. And then just last year, the Italian, um, the case was reopened in the Italian courts and they ruled that there had been a missile attack. So then the government paid out all the compensation. Again, uh, I think it's a really troubling case because there are a number of angles to it and none of them are particularly good. I mean, if it was a missile and the government chose to ignore that, well, you know, there again, we can ask if, if they won't even look after their, their citizens in a tragic situation like that, what, what the hell are they even there for? Surely that's their first responsibility, their minimal responsibility as a government. You know, when, when citizens have lost family uh, um, and are, you know, possibly financially destitute, if they're not up for that, then why are they, why, why do we have a government? You know? <laughs> but, but if it was a bomb and, and the investigators swear uh, to this day that, that, that they weren't influenced, and they arrived at the bomb theory through, you know, examining the evidence impartially, then in that case, it's possible that a terrorist attack or a corporate hit or something like this has gone unpunished and, in fact, pretty much unnoticed. So, yeah, that was another, I would say, very uh, dark chapter in the relationship between governments and, and uh, air tragedy. Indeed. I mean, in this case, it seems like the evidence, uh, well, according to the criminal court in in uh, last year that there was overwhelming evidence that the plane was brought down by a missile and um, so it seems uh, that the governments were questioning governments in this occasion. Yeah. yeah. Now, I also want to talk about uh, Polish Air Force Flight 101 uh, in 2010. Uh, this, this flight went down in a forest uh, next to Smolensk Airport in Russia and on board was the president of Poland, uh, Lech Kaczynski along with various other um, cabinet officials, senior military commanders, and so on. So when this plane crashed, it, it, it cut off the head of, of the Polish state. Um, and it's an extremely uh, intriguing case because it, it illustrates a, a very different kind of uh, political pressure. You had, for example, an air traffic controller who didn't want the plane to land because there was very thick fog, terrible visibility, and the airport lacked uh, some of the equipment which will guide a pilot in to a civilian airport um, in, in those kinds of conditions. It was just a small military airport. Uh, the pilot was also reluctant to land, but decided to land uh, because, it, it, at least people have speculated, um, that he decided to land because the president was on board <laughs> and one of the president's aides was there in the cockpit when the pilots were making de decisions. They were going to a very important uh, official occasion in Russia. So maybe there's and a little bit of uh, a little bit of pressure to land here. Yeah? There was, there was. And in fact, uh, the president, Lech Kuczynski, he, uh, three years before that, I think it was, two years before that, he'd flown to Azerbaijan, uh, and the same pilot who flew to Smolensk was the co-pilot on that flight. So he was flying to Azerbaijan, they got diverted to Tbilisi in Georgia and the president wanted to land in Tbilisi but there was a war going on and the pilot refused to land. That pilot's career was, was damaged significantly by his uh, overruling the president's wishes. So, and and the, the Smolensk pilot was the co-pilot on that flight. So he would seen uh, what could happen if he said, no, we can't land here, it's not safe. And Man, you've got a you've got a question. Um, you've got to question the intelligence of some of these people. If like the captain says, "No, it's too dangerous to land," you're like, "Land the damn thing!" And uh, you know, it's almost like uh, it's it's just kind of stupid, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, on the other side, with the air traffic controller, he didn't have the um, he didn't have the authority to to refuse the the airplane. He didn't have the authority to say, you cannot land here, you must go to the alternate airport, um, because that decision was made much farther up a vast bureaucratic chain, as we all know, you know, exists in Russia. So when you've got the people on the ground with the expert knowledge uh, not being able to make decisions and deferring authority to, to you know, governments and bureaucrats, that's, that's a whole different kind of, uh, of uh, government contribution to tragedy, we could say. Anyway, so, um, that, sorry, yeah. <laughs> how, how did the landing go? The landing did not go well. 
the plane, uh, the, the, the altitude readings that were being received were inaccurate. It was compounded by the fact that just before the airport there's a valley, so there was altitude readings being taken from the bottom of the valley and then suddenly the land rose up. Um, but uh, yeah, in the end the plane clipped uh, some trees, turned over and everybody on board was killed. Um, and I believe there was 96 people on board. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So look, we yeah we don't obviously have a lot of time to talk about it now, but I would encourage everybody to have a look into that case if, if you're interested. It, it's really fascinating, and it was quite momentous. I mean, I uh, when it happened, I was uh, on holiday in Egypt, and I just boarded a flight to Ukraine, and uh, everyone on the airplane was talking about the crash. And for Polish people, and I, I think possibly some of their neighbours too. It's, it's one of those events where you can uh, remember exactly where you were and what you were doing you know, when you heard about it. It's, it's that for me as well. I, I have a really clear picture in my mind of the, of the moment when I heard. So, and, so uh, yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of uh, Polish people did believe there was Russian involvement in this and it wasn't quite as clear cut as just a case of bad thought fog. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we... The, uh, the specific function, um, I mean, the... The official function, which the president and the other dignitaries were going to, was a commemoration of the Katyn massacre. Now, this had taken place in, I believe it was 1944, I might have that year wrong, uh, under Stalin. Stalin's security chief had a very novel policy. Uh, he had decided to uh, completely wipe out the officer class of the Polish army, and Katyn uh, was part of this. So, so the Red Army took 8,000 Polish officers into a forest outside this, this village of Katyn and, and executed them en masse. Uh, and the Soviet authorities denied this and blamed it on the Nazis. Um, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a gradual accommodation between the Russian Federation and Poland on this issue, and it had just reached the point where uh, the Russian Federation was willing to organize an official commemoration inside Russia. And this was going to be the first one. So it was a very important occasion because Katyn is huge in Poland. There are memorials in lots of Polish towns. And I, I personally don't go with the conspiracy theory on, on this particular case, but I can understand why so many Polish people would have thought it possible. I mean, there are many Russians who who really wanted this commem commemoration to happen and did everything they could to make it happen. But I think there are also those who who, who would prefer it, uh, who would, who would have preferred if it didn't happen. And so you know, to be suspicious of of, of that is is certainly plausible. I mean, there was also I mean, people can watch this on the uh, on the internet on YouTube, I believe. But there are documentaries and. Um, people showing um, audio or playing audio which seems to indicate there were gunshots on the ground after the accident, mm -hmm. suggesting that even if there were survivors, they were executed. So, um, you know, how, mu how much truth is in that, I don't know. But I did see some of the video um, and uh, uh, there did appear to be some gun sh gunshot noises. Of course, that, that could have been it only just happened, so it could have been some engine uh, parts exploding. Who knows, anyway? Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot to that case. As I said, uh, uh, if you are interested in this topic, do, do look into it, because it is a, a really uh, fascinating case. And if you have any Polish friends, I'm sure they'll be only, ha only too happy to talk about it. Anyway, what's the uh, next case? Yeah, uh, let's move on from evil governments <laughs> to... Um, to planes that disappear. I, I started. Uh, at, I said at the start that these um, exceptional crashes fall into a few different categories, and disappearances is the other one I wanted to talk about. Because despite what people have been saying, I mean uh, about how MH370 is an unprecedented event, there, there have actually been uh, a lot of airplanes go go missing over the year. It's unprecedented in other ways, but but there have been uh, other disappearances. Just to give you a couple of random examples, uh, the legend of the Bermuda Triangle, of course, very famous. And that legend partly kicked off in 1945. Uh, there were five US Navy airplanes. They took off from Florida in the general direction of Bermuda. They were never seen again. 
Uh, naturally, the military sent out other planes to search for them, and one of those disappeared too. So you're talking about was... the um, the U.S. Navy Avenger planes. I think that was um, yeah Flight 19. They were called, even though it was a squadron. And uh, December the fifth, 1945. That's right. It was Flight 19. Yeah, yeah. So this is part of where Bermuda got its its reputation and its mystique from. Um, was an actual disappearance of half a dozen military planes. There's been all kinds of documentaries on that as well. One person, one guy who. Uh, thought he found uh, one of the planes but I think um, it wasn't confirmed. Mm -hmm. Then uh, much more recently in 2003 a Boeing 727 disappeared from an airport in Angola. Uh, it had just completed its first flight for American Airlines from the US to Angola and then two guys uh, basically stole it. They, they turned off the lights, they switched off the transponder, they powered up they taxied out to a runway without getting clearance from air traffic control, and they, they just took off. Um, they took off with some difficulty, apparently, but they, they did get the plane off the ground. Now, to, to me, I, I've heard about this one, and to me, this sounds mm -hmm. like a classic sort of maybe a secret service operation by another country, because um, there was two men who did this. They none of, Neither of them believed to have been capable of flying the aircraft which is what I read, which is obviously nonsense because you can't just get into an aircraft with, that, with no knowledge whatsoever and take off on a, with a plane this size. It's, it's not feasible, really. And, um, but it is a very interesting story. I mean, yeah, the FBI and the CIA um, have been un unable to find any um, r remains or, or any location of this aircraft at all. Yeah, any trace of it, it just completely vanished. Also, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and U.S. Central Command, they've all tried to locate this plane. No one's seen the plane, no one's seen the pilots. So, quite quite a mystery. But about the guys who, who uh, stole the plane, one of these guys was called Ben Padilla. And he was, uh, he, he was not someone with no clue about how to fly a plane. He was actually a private uh, pilot. And he was a certified flight engineer, which is kind of the third pilot on the flight deck after the co-pilot, and also an air mechanic. So uh, and we know this because um, Padilla's sister has been hounding the FBI about this since it happened. She believes that they're withholding information about it, and she just will not let it go. Um, and, you know, of course, it, it would be easy to write her off as a grieving relative who's just, you know, gone a bit nuts, can't accept her brother's disappearance. But, but if we look at MH370, it's pretty clear that certain governments and their agencies are inclined to hold back information, even if there are, you know, grieving relatives in the mix. So, so who knows? Maybe Padilla's sister is, is right, and that, and and he he was a trained pilot with some purpose that that remains mysterious. Yeah, it's strange that people deny these things are going on because, um, you know, obviously we see th films like James Bond and uh, and people read books about um, spies. Um, and we all know that there's organisations such as Mossad, MI5, MI6. Uh, what's the Australian version, by the way? ASIO. Um, yeah, yeah. The 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 um, the general scoop on ASIO is that they're a really inept intelligence organisation, or alternatively, they're a really good intelligent intelligence organisation using a really inept intelligence organisation as their cover story. Oh, that would be very yeah. that would be very clever. <laughs> it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so what I can't understand is why people deny uh, that strange occurrences that go on could be spies, basically. Mm. So in in this case, for example, it could be that these were agents of some sort stealing a plane for whatever reason. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, one more one more thing I want to one more case I want to talk about, and it's uh, an old one. Uh, after World War II, the, um, the, the British military converted a lot of their uh, Lancaster bombers into passenger planes called Lancastrians. And one of these, in 1947, took off from Buenos Aires uh, to fly to Santiago, disappeared, and wasn't found for over 50 years. Now... <laughs> Um, before it disappeared, it radioed the airport in Santiago to say that it was about five minutes from landing there. Um, and the airport radioed back for confirmation, and then the aircraft sent a message in Morse code, which read S-T-E-N-D-E-C, Stendek. 
The airport in Santiago asked for clarification and twice more, Stendek. That was it. The plane never arrived. It completely disappeared. Um, and nobody has ever worked out what this Stendek means. Yeah, no, but, I, I, I've read about this one as well. I mean, it was very interesting, I mean, especially because of that message that was sent you know, at least three times. So it wasn't a typing error. And yeah, also yeah. because it was, yeah, I think it was four or five minutes away from touchdown. They were literally yeah. saying, we're, we're just coming in for landing, you know. Yeah, that's right. So there was a huge search, of course, for this plane. It was called, the plane was called the Stardust. Uh, there was a huge search for Stardust, combing the, the Chilean Andes up and down. Um, and there was no wreckage found at all. And of course, uh, mountaineers in the area all knew knew about this, you know. So, and the Chilean Andes is a very popular mountaineering destination. So there have been people keeping an eye out for this wreckage for years and years around Santiago. But uh, no wreckage turned up. Uh, there were all kinds of theories, you know, there were only six passengers on board and all of them were quite unusual. They, it's been commented that they uh, had the makings of a, of, a, of a spy novel or an Agatha Christie mystery. There was a Palestinian millionaire on board who was rumoured to have a diamond sewn into his coat. <laughs> there was a messenger from the King of England who was probably carrying quite an important message because uh, at the time there was a lot of tension between Britain and Argentina. So, so people were talking about sabotage, uh, and there was also a theory that <laughs> the plane had been the target of alien abduction. Now, uh, when the BBC produced a documentary about this in 1999, uh, they kind of made this out to be, again, a wacky conspiracy theory. But, you know, this incident occurred in 1947. And as we discussed a few weeks ago, that was the year when the term flying saucer first appeared. And at that time, UFOs hadn't been stigmatized. You know, it was a it was a heyday for sightings and there was uh, there was public interest and there was clearly something unusual going on in the skies around that time but then the same airline lost two more planes they just vanished so it was a very unusual situation and then, um, I just wanted to mention that Stendek was actually a name adopted by a UFO magazine as well yeah yeah time. that's right that's right <laughs> then uh, in the 1990s suddenly a Rolls-Royce engine turned up on the lower part of a glacier uh, below a mountain called Mount uh, Tupangatu. Tupangatu is one of the biggest peaks in the Andes and it's only 50 miles from Santiago. And that's right, uh, that, that was about 52 years later. That's right, yeah. So it had been a major target of the original search and the searchers had combed the mountain exhaustively. Um, there just seemed to be no way that the original search could have missed this huge engine just sitting out in the open on a mountaintop. So again, it just deepened the mystery, you know, and they uh, found... They uh, oh, yeah, sorry, um, you're probably going to say it as well, but they they found an inflated wheel that was still inflated as well. Yeah, that's right, which which means that um, which means that the plane had not uh, experienced... The plane was not coming in for landing. If the plane had been uh, preparing to land, then the landing gear would have gone down and the tyre would have been damaged in the crash. So the, the perfectly inflated tyre means it was inside the aircraft and that the plane ha had not been preparing for landing. Um, also, they found uh, bent back propellers, which is a sure indication that the engines were running when the plane hit the mountain. Um, so there was a search. After the engine was found, there was a search. They found these, the tire, the, the propellers, some human remains. Um, but all in all, they only found 10% of the, the wreckage. Now, um, it was on a glacier. And uh, the, the accident investigators had a, a kind of masterstroke at some point in their investigation because they could not understand the location of this wreckage and the absence of so much of the wreckage. So they decided to go and talk to an expert on glaciers. Um, and he told them, basically, uh, 50 years ago, this point here where this wreckage, uh, everything that's now here at this point where the wreckage is would have been towards the top of the mountain because the glacier is slowly moving. You know? So the pilots had hit the mountain uh, close to the top. You know? Then the glacier had incorporated the wreckage into itself, uh, continued moving down the mountain, reached a point where, uh, where the temperature was warmer, started to melt, and anything that was at that point was then brought back to the surface. Um, so in other words, the plane had been inside the earth for 50 years, and 90% of it still is. Um, as to why they crashed into the mountain, um, 
at the time, uh, it was very rare to fly high enough to hit the jet streams, which now pilots fly in them routinely, and, and, and uh, instruments on modern aircraft take account of them. But these jet streams, they're high altitude winds, um, and in 1947, it was very rare to get high enough for them to, to affect uh, a flight. So nobody really knew about them. But this flight had to go up to 24,000 feet to get over the, over the mountain, and this put them into a jet stream. Their instruments were not designed to detect it, so they went off course, they lost altitude, and they hit the mountain. Um, now, I think that uh, although it's a very old crash, uh, Stardust is particularly relevant to our situation at the moment with, with MH370. Um, you know, we, we talked about government and, and military involvement, and there are plenty of theories about MH370 that put governments in the picture. Uh, I, I personally think that some of those theories are, are definitely worth serious consideration. But there's also another factor. We still don't understand the world we live in nearly as well as we like to imagine. You know? And in, occasionally, that fact bites us on the arse. <laughs> so this plane disappears supposedly minutes from its destination, and because of the vast amount of stuff we don't know about nature, Nobody even guesses the real cause for half a century. And even then, it's only when nature gives us a hand by throwing a Rolls-Royce engine into view that we, we really start to get it. You know? So I think that's going to continue to be a theme in human history. Stuff will happen, and people have their theories. But ultimately, sometimes we just have no idea what the world is capable of. And obviously, that's a, that's a bad thing in, in cases like uh, MH370. But it, it's also a good thing in, in, in other ways. So, as I said, I, I think I think there's a lesson to be learned from this this stardust crash. Absolutely, I, I think I think so too. But I must admit, I'm not a. I, I wouldn't buy that this is a case for MH370 necessarily. I, I would say it's very, very unlikely. Just to, uh, there's definitely a cover up with uh, MH370. If you ask me, just because. Um, because of the technology that's around these days, that wasn't around in the days of this this Stardust incident, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and with places like Diego Garcia, and um, having all the surveillance technology, and and basically this plane flying around, you know, undetected, and that lots of the way the way things have occurred in this particular incident, stage mm -hmm. by stage, everything. I mean, I, I just I just get. I find it unbelievable, really. Like you know, you know, with the pings that were found eventually mm -hmm. near Australia, and then it turns out that that was something like a dolphin that had been tagged or something. Mm -hmm. And um, the other day, I heard um, there, there, there's new ones all the time. I heard they they found um, an audio recording of the impact of the plane as it hit the water. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the article, it's, uh, experts say actually it probably isn't. <laughs> it's just like um, it's just. I find this instant is is quite unique. I mean, I'm not. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm saying there's definitely person. This is just my personal opinion, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is the factors involved in this case seem to me that there's a cover up going on just because yeah, yeah. of the way it's been handled. Um, maybe it's been handled by what was the name of the Australian Secret Service? <laughs> ASIO. Yeah, because it does seem to be completely. Um, really badly handled so it could be, it could be your, your <laughs> yeah. australian secret service um yeah I look as i said i think i think uh the 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 theories which um posit some kind of um <clears throat> government knowledge of this are definitely worth serious consideration but i also think that um i mean if you look at uh going back to air france flight 447 in 2009 yes we have all this great technology but uh this didn't save uh, 200 and what was it? 237 people from dying because of a four-inch-long tube, you know, that that got some ice in it. Um, well, you know, again, I would, uh, I would say, well, that's the that's the explanation for that particular event. But I did watch a documentary about that, and it wasn't just those tubes, by the way. Yeah, that's, it was, that's um, true. It yeah. was three or four very very rare occurrences which were supposed to have all happened at the same time and i must mm -hmm. admit i wasn't i wasn't totally convinced myself on that on that particular thing we were talking before about uh, off air about about autopilots and uh, there was um, as far as i understand the plan, that that particular plane did come out of autopilot at a very inconvenient moment and the pilot uh, was very slow to to pick up 
um, and, and you mentioned this before, that auto, autopilots are um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, a gift, you know, in terms of um, they can make the pilot's job simpler in a tight moment where, where he has to act now and there are half a dozen things that he has to do at once. The autopilot can, can deal with three or four of them and leave the pilot free to deal with the other one or two. Yeah. But they also can be a, a, a pitfall, definitely. Certainly, in that case, um, the the autopilot was was doing strange things to the airplane. There's, which been a, there's actually been a number of cases where autopilots have inadvertently caused the plash, the crash of the plane. Uh, on some occasions, pilots have not realised that the autopilot's disengaged, yeah. and so they've just carried on relaxing it. In other occasions, the pilots have been unable to deal with the situation that's occurred because they're so unused to actual manual flying. Yeah, there are certain um, there are certain scenarios that that uh, I mean there are many many scenarios that are practiced in in, in uh, aircraft simulators, but you know two things about that you can't predict every possible scenario is the first thing and the second thing is uh, flying a simulator simulator and flying an airplane are, are not the same thing. <laughs> um, in the case in the case of Polish Air Force 101, there was a problem with the autopilot as well. The autopilot has a go around function, which is where you um, You've probably seen uh, uh, occasionally an aircraft will come down towards the, the runway on, on landing and the pilot will try a landing, realize it's not going to happen because of crosswind or some other kind of interference. And what happens at that point is the pilot presses go around and uh, that changes all kinds of settings on the plane, flaps and stabilizers and uh, ailerons and so on. So the pilot can concentrate on what he needs to do, which is throttle up. You need speed to get up when you're that low. And you need it right now. Um, but uh, in the in, with Polish Air Force uh, 101, the pilot did that, engaged the go-around function, and there was about five seconds where the go-around function didn't work and the pilot hadn't realized it didn't work or was confused about why nothing was happening. And that definitely contributed to the crash of that plane. So yeah, autopilot can be a trap. Indeed. And um, what other um, incidents have you come across? I mean, there are obviously plenty more, um, which we, you know, we obviously haven't got time to talk about all of them. I mean, we've got the Bermuda Triangle. There was a lot more planes went missing um, due to that. There was... Uh, Korean Airlines Flight 902, two, mm -hmm. KOL 902, which was another um, Soviet Union aircraft. And I think that may have got shot down, uh, with, uh, killing 109 passengers. Um, and speaking of pilot error, there was actually a flight in Russia uh, around about 10 years ago, I think, where uh, a pilot let his son into the cockpit to give him a, a go of the controls uh, at, at just exactly the wrong moment when the plane suddenly um, experienced some kind of problem. And just, you know, there was a kid flying the plane. At the, uh, it was a, one of those flights, you know, where, where the, the, the airplane's highly automated and for most of the flight, the pilots can just sit there and chat. But there are moments in a flight where you need somebody there who knows what they're doing. It was just incredibly bad luck that this kid was sitting in the pilot's seat and suddenly the plane had a problem and, and, and nobody was able to get him out like because of the smallness of the cockpit fast enough to save the plane. It was really a terrible, <sighs> terrible incident. We could talk about this all night. <laughs> Just... uh, another, one I, another one I came across was a <clears throat> flight called Flight 1812. Um, this was involving Israel and Ukraine, so it's mm -hmm. typical. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but basically 78 people killed uh, and Israeli, the Israeli government were saying basically that this was a cover-up by the Ukrainians, that they believed that um, something untoward had happened. Um, and they believed the reason why they were covering it up was to avoid paying compensation. Uh-huh, uh -huh. I haven't heard about that. That's, that's a very interesting one. I'm just going to mention a few others in case people want to go and check... Um, check some others there was the uruguayan 571 which you I'm, i think you'll probably be familiar with have you ever seen the film alive no ah there was um there was a plane bound for chile uh, with some italian maybe football players on board and um, mm -hmm. there's a famous film be being made about it called alive um basically because it crashed in the mountains in the andes and the so there were survivors and the only way they could survive was to eat 
um, the other passengers, the other dead passengers. So it was uh, a movie was made about this, and some of these people, uh, due to their actions, um, obviously still alive now because of it, because of what they did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that does actually sound a little bit familiar now that you mentioned eating dead passengers. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit um, morbid. Um, Amelia Earhart. <laughs> Have you heard yeah. of that case? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know too much about that. that. Was quite some time ago. I think that was in the the thirties. She disappeared yeah. as well. There's another guy who disappeared. Uh, his name was Frederick Valentich in 1978. Oh, I heard about that one. Yeah, and that was interesting because that was to do with UFOs again, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. He actually sent a radio message saying that he that there was a UFO flying above his airplane. Then he disappeared. Yeah, that that's very odd. I mean, some people say that he faked his own disappearance. Uh, yeah. So uh, what was his name again? Uh, Frederick Valentich. So Frederick, if you are out there, please make contact with us. If, if you <laughs> we, did, if you did fake your own death, we'd love you on the show. Yeah. Um, sorry, I said we we're going to be sensitive, and then I just mocked um, someone who's uh, disappeared. <laughs> Never mind. There was another one I came across. An unidentified blip was spotted on a radar in Lake Superior in 1953. Mm -hmm. um, so two planes were sent out to investigate the the blip on the radar so they they watched the two blips go towards the third blip the three blips merged and then those two planes were never seen again wow that's spooky or what that was uh, that, that is extremely spooky that's lieutenant monkler and lieutenant wilson who disappeared on that occasion so there are some extremely weird things going on um i mean that that's obviously odd and actually i did want to mention not necessarily saying uh, these are aliens. When I say UFOs, by the way, some of the ones I came across did did uh, mention blips on radar that were seen at the same time as uh -huh. planes disappearance. And in fact, MH370 is one of those. Um, I don't know if you saw the um, the radar, the initial radar on the last on the first two days of the disappearance. There was a blip that seemed to merge with MH370. Uh -huh. Then the plane disappeared. Now. There's different theories as to what this blip was. Some people say it was another plane. I think it was another plane, personally, but some people say it was another plane, and there's different theories as to how this could have affected flight MH370. One theory is that um, this blip was another plane, and that the MH370 pilot used this other plane to fly very close to it, underneath it, to then fly to its destination um, by switching its transponder off. Um, air traffic control would only see one blip on the radar and it was able to then fly to somewhere like Afghanistan totally undetected by radar because it was flying underneath or above another plane mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which sounds actually quite a credible theory if we're, if we're going to look at the hijack scenario yeah yeah of course yeah. other people are saying this was an unidentified flying object you know alien abduction theory I'm not going to even you know, go there really but you know everyone's entitled to their opinions yeah, indeed, indeed. So thanks ever so much for coming on, um, Anthony. Scott, it's been a pleasure as always. Bye-bye. So lots of cases there which show that there have been cover-ups and shoot-downs in the past. Um, and so we bring ourselves to Flight um, 370, MH370, which I'm not going to go into again because it's been sort of over-covered, but, um, you know, it disappeared on the 8th of March 2014 less than an hour after takeoff and really nothing much has been found ever since personally I'm not sure this plane has crashed into the ocean because there would be some debris now if there was and it did crash then it's a cover-up in my opinion um, even if it didn't crash and there's a hostage some kind of hostage situation going on um, there's been a cover-up um, I'm pretty convinced of that what do you think we're gonna to talk to Sarah Bajak in a moment um, and uh, she's basically launched a campaign to try to raise money to pay a whistleblower to come forward so i hope that's successful um, even books and movies are being made about this incident already i mean a, a new book uh, co-written by a commercial pilot uh, has also claimed the disappearance is no accident and there's a cover-up involved so let's go over to sarah to um to talk about this uh, initiative to find a whistleblower how are you very well, thank you. How are you? Okay, I guess. B uh, having a busy day? Yeah, every single hour has something to take it up. It never ends. 
Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it's a terrible thing because I'm going to continue to put every ounce of effort I have into this until I can find Philip and bring him home. And so that means I'm going to be very, very busy like this for a very long time because there's an endless amount of work to do. Are you finding um, any opportunity to have a break? Uh, not, not particularly. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I carve out a little bit of time here and there. I, I eat dinner with my kids. Um, I've tried to make some time to see friends. And right now I'm busy getting ready to move. I, I move in a week. So there's so much to do with packing and, you know, getting bank accounts closed, etc. But I'm leaving. I'm moving to Kuala Lumpur. Have you, um, have you lived there before? Uh, I have not lived there before. I've traveled there multiple times, but... Um, it's the place that Philip and I had decided to uh, go to next. So we already have an apartment there, and I already have a new job waiting for me. Uh, I was just completing my contract here. So are you going to continue with teaching? Yes, of course. I love it. I imagine your students will be sad to see you leave uh, where you are at the moment. I hope they'll be sad. Um, you know, we all we all want to be valued by the people we spend time helping. Um I think they will be sad. I, I think I think I'm a good teacher and have built a lot of loyalty in my students. Um, you know, so many of them have come with cards and you know they write me notes and send me emails and I still keep in contact with a number of my students from you know the last last year as well and even from a couple of years back. It's it's really a nice it's a nice relationship to be able to perpetuate. You'll have uh, new students in the place you're going to. Is it, is it like an international school or something you're going to? Uh, yes, it's actually the British International School of Kuala Lumpur. Okay, and um, have, you, have you been there already before or is this a completely new uh, place for you? I mean, actually going to that school. Well, I was there to interview with them um, and then I've been back to visit them twice uh, just on, on a trip. Uh, including, you know, I, I had some meetings with uh, family members of uh, children who were interested in, in taking my course. So, you know, we, we call that an options meeting where the, the kids can kind of decide what kind of classes they want to take. So I teach economics and business. So I've already had a chance to meet a good number of my future students. Um, I, I had actually already known a few people who lived there. Uh, and then I've had friends recommend other friends. So, you know, there's a, a very long-term expatriate community uh, in KL that I can already kind of step into. Uh, but then on top of it, uh, there are five different teachers from my current school all going to the Kuala Lumpur area. None to the same school that I'm going to, but uh, will be within, within spitting distance of each other. And, and they've become very good friends over these last couple of years. I mean, we spoke some quite some time ago about um, MH370 and what had happened, um, and there was there wasn't much news at that time. And have you have you felt like there's been any progress at all since we last spoke? Uh, it's not even a matter of feeling. Uh, we have made no progress. There is nothing that we know today that is any different from what we knew on March eighth. It does seem that way, doesn't it? Um, has there been any new analysis of that InMASAT data? Because uh, they did release some of that data, didn't they? Uh, they only released part of what was asked for. So, you know, that, okay, we can learn a few extra things from this, but not much. You know, they really needed to, um, you know, release the metadata and release, you know, all of the data from the engines, including from the day before and from earlier in the flight. You know, they only released, uh, they, they omitted like the first six entries. And then we know the entries existed, but we don't know what they had in them. And they've uh, eliminated columns, whole columns of content. So, um, you know, they're, they're clearly hiding something. I mean, you know, they only, they only give it out in little bits and pieces. And, um, I heard about your whistleblower fund. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so we decided that we're not getting anywhere with the official investigation. Um, I believe personally that that's a combination of incompetence uh, or at least misguidance of the honest people 
And I think that there are at least a couple of parties who are actively deceiving us and misdirecting the search. So, you know, it's kind of a combination of incompetence and obfuscation. And so, you know, we figured we had to take matters into our own hands. And anybody who has ever done any kind of uh, traditional investigative casework so I've, I've spent a good deal of time talking to professional investigators, including those who specialize in what they call cold cases. And the consistent theme is that there's always someone who knows something. It's just a matter of finding them. And, you know, oftentimes people know things, but they're either afraid to come forward um, because of repercussions, and they don't know how to do so confidentially, uh, or they don't know how to come forward. You know, they, they, they know they have something to say, but they have no clue who to say it to, or maybe even they even try to say it and nobody's listening to them. Uh, and then on top of it, you know, you have those people who maybe are willing to come forward, but realize that it will probably cause them to lose their job or, um, or to be uncomfortable where they are, and so they'll have to leave the environment in which they are, and that takes money. So, you know, all the way around, we believe the whistleblower campaign not only gives people an avenue through which they can provide their information confidentially and in a way that they can feel confident it will be looked at, um, but also it, it provides the incentive for them uh, to have, uh, have a little bit of money to disappear with if necessary. How will a whistleblower get in contact with you? I mean, will they leave the information there anonymously, or will they? Um, how, how will they go about doing it? Uh, we will be launching a website uh, tomorrow. Actually, it'll be the fifteenth or Eastern Standard Time, so day after tomorrow, I guess, for you. Um, and those, I mean, on that website, we'll be collecting leads. Uh, in a confidential way. We won't track any kind of IP addresses, uh, and the individual will have to fill in a couple of fields. But the reward is payable only to somebody who actually can submit evidence. So just saying, I have a theory, and this is what I believe, and you'll find the airplane at these and these coordinates. Well, that's not evidence. Um, we've had thousands of those kinds of leads, some more convincing than others. You know, we need somebody, a whistleblower is indeed somebody who knows where the plane is, right? So, you know, we're hoping that, that uh, we'll, we'll see good progress with more quality leads once we get that website up. If someone does do that, if they do say the plane are at these coordinates, um, have you got any way that you can actually check up on that or are you not bothering checking up on those? Uh, we have hired a professional investigation firm. Uh, they're very well respected, a relatively good sized firm. They're licensed officially to do business um, in, the, in the country in which we've selected them. And um, they have actually investigated airline or aviation accidents in the past. Uh, they've also worked with you know, other law enforcement. So they're a you know, really valid and, and respected firm. If we if we believe that the evidence that somebody submits justifies a look in the water or a look on land someplace, yes, they would be qualified to do that. But again, you know, we've had so many thousands of very earnest sounding leads come to the table saying, you know, look in this coordinate, look in this coordinate, but so far none of them have produced evidence. Uh, evidence is primary evidence, actually a photograph, like a real photograph where you can actually see what something is, not just an, an, in, uh, an insinuation photograph. You know, it could be audio files, it could be you know, personal statements or confidential documents um, that can be validated to be real. I mean, and this will potentially make the people who are covering up what's happened here um, quite nervous. What kind of response are you getting so far? Uh, well, the response from the media about the campaign has been amazing, and uh, we actually had a quote released from uh, one of the ministers in um, Malaysia saying that he thought it was a good idea. So we've kind of had some 
maybe not outright approval and endorsement, but certainly acceptance of our effort from the authorities. Um, in terms of the campaign itself, we've gotten kind of a slow start. Uh, we are not nearly as uh, far along as we had expected to be. Uh, as of this morning, we only had uh, 540 donations. You know, I find it now the amount of the donations has been amazing. In fact, I've been just shocked at how much money people have been willing to step forward with. We've had a $5,000 donation, two $2,500 donations, a number of $1,000 donations. Um, in fact, I think our average donation size is almost $100. But there's very few of those $5 donations. You know, we expected to have you know, tens of thousands of people care about this. You know, just my Finding Philip Wood Facebook page has 36,000 likes on it. You know, I had expected to have, you know, thousands of people responding. You know, and if it's only for $5, because that's all you have, then that's fine. I mean, this this is a matter of, you know, what you have comfort with, but, but I did expect more support than only 540 people. I think there's probably still um, quite a large uh, proportion of the population that would like to think that these things don't get covered up or there is no cover up but I mean that's not what I think but I think that may be part of the problem. Yeah perhaps you're right but you know even if there is no cover up there is no claim. So you know even if the the failure of the campaign to to produce something is not a cover-up. Maybe it, it really is just incompetence. You know, the reality is they still haven't found the plane. So, you know, even if you don't believe in cover-up, you should want the truth. And, you know, a fresh pair of eyes could see something differently. Indeed. Um, we're doing a show um, today or tomorrow um, on missing planes. And um, I'm, I've been doing some research. And this really is a very different case. I mean, in most other cases planes have been found um, sometimes you know within days or weeks uh, sometimes there, there are other cases where um, it's been a lot longer but with this case it really is different I mean especially in this day and age with all the technology that we have um, there, there should really there's been no evidence of any crash or anything like that um, I mean I did hear of um, I saw on the internet today some release of some audio recording that that uh, in uh, near Australia, I think. Um, but then even that was put down to oh, it, 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 it's not very likely it was the plane. So uh, it just seems there's so much um, there's so much speculation, so many theories in this case. I mean, how how on earth do you know when you're you're onto a good lead? Uh, it's it's not easy actually. Um... You know, from the, from the experience that I've had in the last three months, I mean, I'd have to go through and actually count them, but there, there have been thousands of leads submitted. They, they could be subclassified into about 12, you know, primary lead types, and there's duplication amongst them. Um, that alone is an indicator that it's probably not Right. Do you say what I'm saying? The, the person who knows where that airplane is, is probably unique in coming forward. Um, and so my personal belief is that we're going to see the real answer in that one person who can come forward with concrete evidence and say, here's where it is, and it's probably going to be the first time we've seen that. Do you know if there's been any assistance by um, government agencies like the CIA, FBI, those kind of people? Well, the, they have offered assistance to me. I mean, both NTSB and um, uh, and the FBI uh, have assigned contacts to interface with me, as has the embassy. But they can't tell me anything at all. I mean, the reality is... The only thing they can tell me is that they can't tell me anything. Right? They can't confirm or deny U.S. involvement in any way. And I tried dozens of different questions, including some I thought were fairly innocuous, and they just refused to answer them. So, you know, <laughs> I, 
I don't know what that says. Um, and what's your what's your plans now? Um, uh, you know, once this uh, is there a time limit for this um, particular whistleblower fund? Uh, we gave it thirty days. Um, the Indiegogo fund is the primary one that we had decided to launch, partly because it's the one that both Ethan Hunt, who's one of our um, governance committee members, and myself had prior experience with. So I've never run a campaign on Indiegogo, but I've donated to a number of causes on Indiegogo and Kickstarter. So those are the two that I'm comfortable with. They're, they're very high-tech focused, product focused. But um, we will be launching uh, additional campaigns on different sites, probably two more sites, maybe three more, that cater to different crowds. So, you know, there's, there's probably about a dozen reputable crowdfunding sites uh, globally. And, uh, I mean, the sites that have been validated enough that they're not just crooks, right? They're actually real sites and real funding happens. And... You know, people get what they're expecting. But of those, I think there's probably two or three others that would give us a good cross-section um, of other access, like more European focus, as an example, or more focus into the young crowd, like the college student crowd. Um, we really need this to be, you know, a community effort. I, personally, I would far rather have a million people supporting this, even at $5 a piece, than, you know, and than just dozens of $100 contributions. Now, not, clearly, we want the $100 contributions, too. If people can afford it and they believe it's important to find the truth, they should give as much as they feel comfortable with. But, you know, we really need the masses to step forward. You're voting with your pocketbook that it's not okay for this to go unsolved. And have you focusing on any of your efforts on contacting sort of celebrities or um, people who who do have the money? I don't even know where I would start. You know, I, I honestly have no clue how I would do that. But if you have any suggestions on how to do that, or perhaps somebody who listens to your show has an in to somebody who's got some money um, or some notoriety, you know, even just an endorsement would be really useful. Indeed, yeah. If there is anyone listening, then please um, contact us or um, contact Sarah. How do they go about um, finding the, the, this site and how do they contact you if they do have um, some information? Well, the, the fundraising site is Indiegogo. That's I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O dot com. And once there, they can uh, search for reward MH370, and they'll find us. Um, they can also come to the Finding Philip Wood Facebook page, and there are a number of uh, media interviews that I've done on the reward, as well as links to the reward site. Um, we will publish on the reward site, as well as a separate website and various Facebook sites, the lead um, website as well in another two days. We can't publish it yet because it's not live. We haven't finished testing it. So people can watch out for that then in a couple days. So that's uh, indiegogo.com. Search for reward MH370 or go to Finding Philip Wood um, on Facebook. You can also um, email scottsentinel9 at gmail.com if you want to um, get in touch with Sarah. If you know of any um, people who do have um, a lot of money they could contribute to this fund. Um, how are the families getting on at the moment? I, I think it's become very, very difficult for the families uh, this last month, um, even, wor even worse than before. Y you know, on the one hand, you think that it would get it would get easier because time has gone by, right? But the only thing that's happening is that the scar tissue has gotten thicker, but the pressure underneath the scar tissue has actually increased as well. Um, you know, it's not only about our loved ones being gone, but it's a, it's about the fact that we all believe that there's still a chance they could be alive, and we feel a, a huge pressure to do something to make a difference and to be able to find them. I mean, it's, it's just astounding to me that the world can, can forget that a plane has gone missing. Um, and it's been allowed to stay missing because of our governments, I believe, withholding information. 
I agree. This is disturbing for me. In fact, doing this um, episode that we're doing um, today or tomorrow um, on missing planes, I realised that there's quite a lot of missing planes over the years, and um, yeah, we, we definitely, definitely need answers to every single case, really, just so that we can prevent it from happening again. Absolutely. Now, um, there is obviously a chance that um, the, the plane is somewhere and passengers are still alive. Have you th tried to think of a scenario where that where that could actually take place? I mean, because if if they were being held hostage for some reason, why why would not the hostage takers have contacted anyone about it? Why would it be a secret, or would, would this be maybe? a government operation where they would have taken the plane for some reason. Have you actually run through any of these scenarios at all or talked about them with anyone? Oh, of course. You know, of the of the dozen leading scenarios, um, about half of the leading theories are making the assumption that the passengers are still alive, or at least some of the passengers are alive. Um, you know, whether that was through a hostage taking and the reason we haven't heard anything yet is that they're not ready to do anything. I mean if the purpose of, of terrorism is to incite terror then leaving something a mystery is its own form of terror, right? And maybe they've been waiting until it dies down and then they'll release their big shock. We don't know. Um, if it was government intervention, it could be accidental that there are hostages and they don't want to do anything with them, but they're not sure what to do with them. And, uh, you know, it could be that they're just waiting for it to die down and maybe they'll somehow release them out quietly. Who knows? Um, but then, you know, as, as painful as it is, you know, some of the scenarios have the passengers not being alive, but that doesn't change the fact that we still need to find them. Um, I heard that there was, um, I mean, I, you hear a lot of things on the internet, obviously, so who knows what's true these days, um, but I heard there were military operations on the same day uh, in the, near that area. Have you heard anything about that, or did you find out any information about that at all? Uh, that is one of the scenarios, um, that there was military operation and that somehow perhaps the airplane MH370 was a, you know, an innocent bystander in a catastrophic issue and that the cover-up is indeed covering that up. <laughs> um, so that is one of the potential scenarios. I don't want to speculate, but one other thing, I remember in the very early days, um, the Chinese authorities re released uh, an image saying, oh, this is something we've seen in the sea. And then, then it was quickly said that, um, oh no, that was a mistake. And some people have said, no, that wasn't a mistake. They were trying to expose something. Um, have you heard that theory as well? Uh, yes, I've heard that theory. Um, that goes along with the theory that Tom Nod was really a government exercise to make sure that any satellite images that indeed had wreckage in them um, could be easily cleaned up, right? So, <laughs> so in effect, people who were all working to try to find the plane were really assisting the government in covering up the plane. But, you know, these are all theories, and, and honestly, I don't know, and I do not have a single theory that I believe is the truth because there's no evidence. And so, personally, I will not make a decision or stick into one line of thinking until I have proof of some sort. Honestly, it actually gives me a headache trying to think about, um, you know, trying to work it out because I think it's impossible. I mean, at the end of the day, I think you do need somebody to come forward who knows what they're talking about. and. Um, I really hope that someone does come forward in this successful campaign um, and that people do uh, give some money. I'm going to go and donate now myself, I think, because um, I, I honestly haven't so far. I think sometimes it's just about finding the time, uh, just just making the time to go and do it. So um, I'm going to go and do it now, and, uh, and I suggest anyone who do listening who does care about this incident at all uh, or you know cares about the fact that plane has gone missing and that you know are even just from the, from a safety point of view um, or would like to get answers to what's happened here because it's not like it's not nice to have these mysteries hanging around anyway then please go and uh, donate okay so uh, I really hope you get some answers Sarah thanks for joining us today thank you Scott and um, speak to you again at some point in the future hopefully with some good news yeah
that would be lovely. Okay, take it easy and good luck in um in your new uh, area where you're going to be living in your new job as well. Great, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks to Sarah for that. Remember, we welcome listeners as well as um, guest speakers on this show. So if you want to come on this show and you're just a listener, but you, you have some uh, extensive knowledge on a subject, or you just want to come and say hello, uh, please drop us an email, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com, and we'll see if we can get you on. Don't forget to visit us um, on Facebook, Scott Sentinel, or um, on Twitter as well. Topics coming up in future episodes could include satanic rituals and the occult, uh, zombies and um, uh, voodoo, mysterious celebrity deaths, planned obsolescence, patterns in world events, the Dyatlov Pass incident. Now to uh, the um, economic sports space and weather section where we talk about anything that may have cropped up. Um, not much to talk about in the economics world. I'm not going to talk too much about it at the moment anyway. I'm sure there is lots to talk about. Um, I, chemtrails. I was um, I was walking along in Harrow, London, um, a few weeks ago, and I, and I, there was quite a few trails across the sky. Um, one, there was a plane that was going along, pumping out two jets of thick white um, pollutant. And it was not dispersing, it was just staying in a really long uh, line that must have gone several miles across the sky and just ha hung there, uh, didn't dissipate at all. Um, this, this is what I think a lot of people are talking about um, as, as chemtrails. Now I don't, I'm, I'm not, I, um, I'm not uh, too well informed on this topic, but at some point I do want to get someone on to talk about it. I don't know if it's happening, but Certainly, there did, did seem to be like a pattern of these lines across the sky in London. Um, and they do seem to be different from your normal uh, contrail that most planes leave. Now, um, these, it has been admitted by um, people such as um, Al Gore that this, this is being looked into, uh, geoengineering, um, scientists have been looking at ways to affect the climate now if this is going on i definitely would want to know about it so i think we we deserve to know if it's not going on then just say okay it's not going on now if it is going on then i'm sorry but i don't want these kind of things being pumped into the air when i that i can breathe in so we do need to know something about this again it's another case of we're just asking questions what is are these are these normal planes or um you know, is there such a thing going on? It seems like there is, according to some scientists. So, would would that bother you if um if you found out they're 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 spraying um chemicals over cities? I mean, I know that's actually occurred in Ukraine because, like I, I think I've mentioned it before, when um when there was a pneumonia scare in um, West Ukraine, they sprayed um some chemicals over the city to try to control it. So, these things do go on, you know. Obama says denying climate change is the same as saying the moon is made of cheese. I'm not sure if it's quite the same. I mean, on climate change, my, my views are we should respect nature and our planet regardless of any government-led programs. Um, I, I've got no idea if um, climate change is changing due to mankind's pollution. I suspect not, but I, I'm not totally sure. I suspect that if there is climate change going on due to pollution, it's more likely to be because of the... Um, thousands of nuclear bombs that we've tested over the years. I mean, you've got those plumes of radioactive blasts going up into the atmosphere. Um, of course, that's going to have an effect. Whatever has happened, I don't like the way political correctness is forcing people to remodel their opinions um, or for people such as scientists or just normal people being ostracized or ridiculed um, because of their beliefs on evolution, climate control, religion. It's just another form of control, you know, um, populations have control over each other by, um, by doing this and governments have control over people's thoughts as well. My slight scepticism about climate change and whether it's happening is based on the fact that if people like Obama are promoting it, then there should be great caution about putting too much faith in it. The World Cup has started in Brazil. Um, a, lot of, a lot has been said about the money Brazil were able to come up for this tournament despite their areas of poverty in the favelas. I've seen stories this week of um, street kids being killed by the police to sort of clean up before um, the, the World Cup. I hope that's not true. 
Um, there's been definitely been arrests. Um, at least 18 people were arrested uh, during the protests outside the World Cup soccer tournament across the country. Qatar World Cup corruption claims continue. FIFA facing fresh allegations of corruption over its decision to award the 2022 World Cup to Qatar. Sepp Blatter says these ac accusations are racism, common tactic to try and gain support by using things like racism to try to defend your point of view. So the World Cup started anyway. French manager Didier Deschamps claims a training session ahead of their World Cup opening game was interrupted by a drone hovering over the pitch. Get used to drones because these things are, gonna, are here to stay. Deschamps says the unmanned flying machine was spotted above the team's Brazilian base. Um, apparently drones are used more and more, said Deschamps, ahead of his team's Group E match with Honduras on Sunday. We don't want intrusion into our privacy. It's hard to fight against it. FIFA handles this and has been carrying out an inquiry. Um, drones are more commonly used to spy on military targets, but are increasingly being used against civilians. First, they're going to be used for spying. Later on, I, it wouldn't surprise me if they're going to be used to detain or even kill uh, citizens. And when that starts, it's time to find a, a safe place. Just to finish today, remember, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Albert Einstein said that, and he was a fairly intelligent guy. We encourage the sharing of this show and posting of links on other sites. Um, adding playlists onto your pages. Try to please help promote this um, this site if you can and these shows. Um, we would like to try to get more listeners and uh, the more listeners we can get then the more um, guests we can get on that kind of thing. So if you can I would just ask please today if you could maybe share some of these links on your Facebook pages or um, share it on YouTube just try to help promote it if you can. I'd be really grateful if you could do that anyway. Always looking for sponsors, advertisers that fit in with the ethics of this show. Um, finance, please uh, get in contact, scottsentinel9 at gmail.com if you want to become involved in any way as well. We always need help, so please get in contact. The kind of help we would need would be helping to promote the show. Uh, what else? Uh, helping to contact guests helping to, uh, if, if you know any celebrity guests who'd like to talk, come on and talk, it, it always helps because celebrity guests will bring in the numbers of listeners as well, which will means that we can get even better guests on in the future as well. Um, so just, you know, just contact us if you feel like you'd like to help in any way. Anyway, thanks for listening. Catch you later. Goodbye.